Today I want to highlight very briefly that not only is Chris a consummate scientist, but he is a serial entrepreneur as well. He has been a co-founder of three startup companies that I could find. That doesn't mean there aren't <laughs> others uh, in the works. But his startup companies have brought in business investments over a hundred million dollars as given on one of the many websites that you wow. are on. Okay. Yeah, you didn't even know, right? <laughs> uh, he is the hold currently holds with his peers four patents and has nine patents currently pending. Um, and we heard about one of his companies yesterday, Xtalic. And the amazing thing about this company, not only has it been successful, but it was also started four years after receiving his PhD. Um, four years after yeah. receiving mine, I am standing here in front of you and introducing <laughs> this fabulous man. Um, and what impresses me most about Chris is not only is he such an amazing scientist and entrepreneur, above all else, he is a fabulous human being. And I had the honor <laughs> of sitting in a lecture that he gave at MS&T two years ago where he reminded us in the audience uh, that family comes first over everything else and that requires sacrifices every day because of us all. And so with that, I thank you for spending the week with us away from your family. <laughs> and I look forward to your second lecture. Wow, thank you. <clears throat> Jeez, I'm, I'm blushing. So um, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Um, so let's see. Um, can I start with a quick show of hands? How many are repeat customers from yesterday? Oh my gosh, everybody. OK, so, um, so I got bad news. Uh, it, it's all downhill from here, right? So, <laughs> um, But what I thought I would do is I, I'd like to live up to my promise from yesterday. So yesterday, I promised you that over three days, I would first introduce a concept, and then I would develop it. And I would really like to develop it both in breadth and in depth. And today, I want to do it primarily in breadth. So today I want to talk about engineering, I want to talk about tech transfer, and I want to talk about what makes a materials innovation something worthy of pursuing in an entrepreneurial setting. And so that's why the title today is about materials entrepreneurship. I'm going to take our concepts from yesterday and I'm going to broaden them out and talk about the platform technology aspects that I see in, in what we talked about yesterday. So today's talk is about engineering. And if you've forgotten, and I know you probably mostly forgot about what I talked about yesterday, I'm going to give you sort of the Reader's Digest condensed summary of yesterday's lecture. And for the like two people who weren't here yesterday, this is your, your uh, catch-up opportunity. So yesterday I put forth a recipe for how we were going to make nanostructured metal coatings. The basic premise is I'm interested in electrodepositing polycrystalline materials in which the scale bar is going to be on the nanometer scale. Those are nanocrystalline coatings. And because of their very fine grain size, they're going to be very hard thanks to conventional hull patch type strengthening. And that's the trend, of course, we're going backwards here. That's the trend shown here, where even a non-structural material, like even high purity nickel, high purity nickel is not really a structural material. But if you make it nanostructured, in fact, it can be because of hull patch strengthening. And in fact, it is a very nice opportunity to coat lower cost substrate materials and give them enhanced surface properties. Electroplating, of course, is my method of choice for doing the coating because it scales so well. And it allows me to address all kinds of decidedly unsexy engineering components like the ones we discussed yesterday, including gravure wheels and automotive bumpers and faucetry and, and so on. Now, yesterday's theme was about a very specific application, right? It was about replacing a particular coating, chromium-based coatings. And so yesterday, we focused quite a bit on sort of societal needs and about looking for sustainable options to other materials that are out there. But that was sort of you know, merely part of the story. The key part of the story that I hope you took away yesterday, if you were here, was that in order to deploy coatings in these kinds of applications that have very, very fine nanostructure, 
there's only one way to make that technologically viable, and that is to address the stability problem that comes with those nanocrystalline structures. So my key theme is about structural stability at the nanoscale. And again, this is the oldest problem in the material science playbook. It's about grain growth. Yesterday I showed you these data from this Canadian group by Hibbert et al., who in 2002 really showed why merely making a nanocrystalline material is not good enough for products, because you can make them today with a nanostructure that is very, very hard. But if you give them temperature and time, then they are going to grow and they're going to lose their properties. And so they did their work at 400 Celsius and watched this happen in a matter of seconds. But what I told you yesterday is that this happens even at room temperature. And so I'll show you here some collected data. I apologize that I haven't cited all the many authors that have contributed to this compilation that we made. But what you're looking at here are a bunch of pure metals that people have made with grain sizes below 50 nanometers. And then they expose those to one hour of thermal exposure. And they sort of watch at what temperature you see the onset of rapid grain growth. And what I want you to take away from this chart is what incredibly low homologous temperatures are needed to trigger grain growth in a nanocrystalline material. The excess energy of all those interfaces is a huge driving force for grain growth. So in nickel, like I told you yesterday, something like 10% of the melting point absolute is all it takes to see grain growth out of the nano range after only an hour of thermal exposure. And that's true for almost any, any metal. It doesn't matter how high their melting point is. It's near room temperature that you start to see the grain growth. So it is critical to talk about stability. Yesterday we talked about stability. You met my dog, Gibbs. And we talked about the thermodynamic proposition of how we will try to stabilize nanostructure. Just to remind you, it's not just about putting in kinetic impediments to slow down grain growth. Hopefully you remember what I'm really after is a thermodynamic stabilization of the structure. I would like to take the free energy surface that drives grain growth which is, encourages the system to want larger grains. And I would like to manipulate that free energy landscape with alloying. So a quick reminder, the idea is, instead of having a pure material, I'm going to add a second component, which decorates the grain boundaries because it has a free energy of segregation that is positive. It decorates them with a certain specific excess. And it adds this red contribution to the energy landscape such that when fully integrated up, it's going to have a shape schematically that looks like this. So I can envision having a nice deep metastable or even stable well at a finite grain size where the grains don't want to grow. Now, at this point, I find you know, usually people will go along with that explanation the first time, and then I move fast enough that they don't think hard about it. But you've had a whole day to think about it. And so I know that you're wondering what this looks like and, and what does it mean to have a material that's sitting on this side and this side. And so I thought I would add just a little bit more depth on what's going on in these systems. And if you'd really like to see what these look like, my preferred method of modeling these systems is to use a lattice Monte Carlo approach. Because this allows us to sample alloy configuration space and grain topology configuration space over an ergodic range. So we can look at the full range of possible microstructures in a nanocrystalline alloyed system. And so what you do is you build a lattice. Every point in the lattice, you can think of it as being like an atom. So we're going to give it a chemical identity. And we're going to do the classical energy calculation. We're going to calculate the internal energy of the system. And for demonstration purposes, we can keep this simple. And we can just use pairwise interactions. So what I'm going to do is you know, every bond in this system is countable. And you can assign it an energy. And so if we have bonds between like atoms, AA and BB bonds, we'll add up the energies of those bonds according to the number of them. And uh, we can put in now systems that have non-zero heats of mixing. So we can have additional energetics from the mixing. And we can do that both in the grain interior. And now if this lattice incorporates assigned grain numbers, now we can also put in grain boundaries. And so we can repeat that in the grain boundaries and give those separate energetics. So now we have a very simple model system. Um, we can now run simulated annealing, the Monte Carlo method. And we can ergodically sample all possible chemical configurations. And at the same time, we can change the grain structure and we can look for energy minima. So 
uh, in this schematic diagram here, this, this is very schematic, but this approach can be, in fact, quite quantitative if you populate it with the right energetics. And so I'm going to show you a simulation for a specific system, uh, which I won't tell you what it is until tomorrow. But this is a simulation for a nominal alloy system that just has it exactly right. Okay? So this is a BCC alloy. It's a three-dimensional simulation. And this is the equilibrated structure for a given composition. So this system has found the global minimum that lowers the free energy. And it is sitting right at the bottom here. And you can see the structure I'm trying to build. The equilibrium structure is one that looks like a stone wall, right? So we've got a bunch of stones. And now the solute that I've added is the mortar holding all those stones together, right? So it's perfectly decorated. It looks somehow ideal. Now, what I can do is, with the Monte Carlo model, I can now explore the shape of this energy landscape. And you can do it, again, quantitatively. So here's a thought experiment. I'm going to take this alloy and I'm going to force it to have a finer grain size at fixed composition. So I'm literally going to walk this way. And you kind of know what that's going to look like. This is the classical grain growth driving force. And so if I walk to the left on this curve, what I'm basically doing is I'm making, making the grains smaller at fixed composition and they are therefore getting less decorated with solute. If you kind of compare this one and that one, you can see they're more sparsely decorated. They're not saturated with solute. So we've created more grain boundary area without satisfying it chemically. And therefore, if the system had its druthers, it would slide this way. It would slide back down this curve and grow the grains until they were saturated. So that's classical grain growth. The other side is the side that most material scientists sort of don't immediately wrap their heads around. And that includes me. I still don't quite get it. But here's what happens if I take this structure, if I try to enlarge the grain size in this system, in order for that to happen, I have to eject solute into the grains. And if the alloy energetics are such that that bulk interaction is less favorable than the grain boundary one, as it is in most grain boundary segregating systems, that grain growth and that ejection of solute can actually come at a penalty to the overall system energy. And so it's an upward walk. And so the system would, in fact, not walk that way. right? It would rather stay down here. So that's basically the premise. So, so if we turn that around, if we started on the right, <laughs> with that right, and you applied temperature and time, does that mean it would go to the middle and walk down that hill? So the question is, what if I could build this system in the lab? Would it slide back down to the left? And here's my best guess of an answer. So um, it would want to. But kinematically, I'm not sure nature has a mechanism to do that, right? So grain growth, when you grow grains, the topological changes of small grains annihilating, what you need is something that reverses that, right? So entropy is driving toward having fewer grains. If you wanted to reverse that process, you would need some spontaneous nucleation of new grain boundary area. And I'm not sure that kinematically the chemical forces would be enough to make that happen. The one possible exception is if you could have enough chemical delta there to trigger recrystallization, mm -hmm. that might be possible. And that's something I'm thinking about these days. It, but I've never seen grains convincingly shrink. But I lay awake at night dreaming about it. And I tell you, well, I lay awake at night thinking about it, and then I fall asleep and dream about it. So, <clears throat> yep. Theoretically, if you change the solubility limit of different, you use a different mat material, let's say the effect on the energy is the same, but the solubility limit is different. How would you expect it to then bend this curve? Because it will not want to go that way. So tomorrow, th that's a great question. So today I wanted to focus on engineering and breadth. Tomorrow I'm going to go m even deeper on this thermodynamics, and I'm going to talk about second phases, because that's another kinematic thing that can happen. Instead of this going into solution, you can have a second phase pop out. And that is a competing ground state. And that will screw up everything that I'm saying here. And tomorrow, it's going to screw it up good. So we'll, we'll talk about it then. Yeah? Does this equilibrium composition and grain size always occur at the solubility limit? Um, to first order, it occurs at the solubility limit and beyond. Right? So these alloys are super saturated according to the bulk diagram. And the reason they're super saturated is that the grain boundaries accommodate excess. So um, 
you'll remember from yesterday that the reason I find this intriguing is not just that the thermodynamics are fun, but I really like that this is an engineering tool where maybe I can control grain size. So yesterday I described to you how this red curve, because you know, we put that there, we've chosen a solute and we've put it in intentionally, we can move it around. And you know, in, the, in the case of this simulation, this is kind of the behavior that I'm talking about. If I put a little bit of solute in and I equilibrate, I'll get one grain size where those grains are perfectly decorated. And as I add more solute, the system will spontaneously find a ground state that has smaller grains in order to accommodate it. And I end up with these master curves where grain size becomes a predictable function of composition, and in fact, a parabolic function of composition. So that, to me, this is the most tantalizing thing, that grain size is controllable and alloying is going to control grain size. And yesterday, I showed you how we actually managed to pull that off in the case of nickel tungsten. So who are my uh, PhD students in the audience? Show of hands. OK, so this is something to aspire to. Um, if you are really successful with your thesis, your advisor will someday put it on a single slide. OK? <laughs> So this is uh, Andy's thesis on a single slide. You'll remember uh, if you were here yesterday that we did simulations to sort of find that tungsten segregates to grain boundaries in nickel. We calibrated a regular solution model in order to make a, a prediction of how we could control grain size. We went in the lab. We figured out how to electroplate it. And we were able to make all those grain sizes. Uh, in fact, we were able to make those grain sizes on demand by simply changing the current input as we are electroplating. And, and so we could make layered systems and many grain sizes. And all of that was because we had tungsten segregating to the grain boundaries and, and controlling the grain size for us. So what I want to do with my time today is talk about you know, whether or not this is a technology that is worthy of entrepreneurial time and investment. Right? Somebody, not somebody, Jennifer, asked me yesterday, what made you think that you should start a company to pursue this? And so I'm going to give you my answer. I'm not sure it's the answer, but it's an answer. Um, if you look at this technology as being you know, a single instantiation of a single solution to a single problem, if you think this is just a coding that's going to go on a certain widget or two, then probably the fastest and best way to commercialize it is to work with a partner who cares a lot about that. And they'll take it from you, and they'll license it, and they'll optimize it, and they'll do it. The reason that I didn't do that with this technology, and the reason I thought maybe this is worth pushing it on it myself, is because I saw here a potential platform. right? And the platform idea, I think, is a powerful one, and I think it's very common in material science. And I think material scientists don't appreciate this quite as much as they should. Very often, we're in the lab working on a specific problem, and we come up with an interesting solution to our problem. And that solution is a material. And the thing about materials is single materials are frequently used in lots of di diverse places. And although you've focused on one, maybe you can plug it in in lots of places. And you know, already here, we've talked about a few pretty different applications. But I think we could do even more than that. Nickel coatings are used in lots of things. And I, so I'll talk a little bit about that. The other thing is that, you know. We've made this material in a certain way, and we started with a simple concept and a, and a base metal of nickel. But lots of metals are electrodeposited. So we could have been doing a different metal in the first place. And maybe this concept maps over. Maybe I can play this trick again in other base metals and use the same thermodynamic effects. And even beyond that, a single materials design concept, maybe this will even go beyond electrodeposition. Right? You know, if, if Gibbs taught us anything, it's that thermodynamics applies to everything, right? So why should I limit my discussion to one processing method? So the reason, Jennifer, that I started this company is I felt that it was the right thing for the technology. I wanted to see this as, as a platform, and I saw a lot of different things that we could do with it. And so that's why I found it ecstatic. And what I want to tell you about is sort of how for the past Gosh, it's almost 12 years now since we started Extalic. I've been trying systematically with my colleagues at Extalic to expand these axes and show the platform potential of the idea. So I'm going to start by talking about a completely different and, and 
almost perpendicular application of nickel-based coatings and how you might care about changing the grain size in those guys. And keeping with my, uh, you know, my life theme of working on utterly unsexy engineering components, I offer you this guy here. This guy is a backplane server electrical connector. Okay, so this is the thing that's on the back of a server bank at YouTube or Twitter or whatever. So if you're tweeting right now, all of your signal is flowing through these guys. And there are lots of these on the back of a server bank, and there are lots of server banks. And all of these things are little chunks of metal that have incredibly challenging metallurgical performance conditions attached to them. And as it turns out, you know, they're copper-based substrates, and they're all electroplated with nickel. It's a giant industry that electroplates nickel, and it puts nickel on there for a number of reasons that I'm going to show you. But the nickel it puts on is essentially reasonably high purity. It's plated from a sulfamate bath. It's a reasonably high purity nickel. There's nothing special or engineered about that nickel. You plate it, and it comes out microcrystalline. Then you're going to do stuff to it. You're going to stamp it and form it, and you're going to braze things and solder things to it. And if you heat it up, and I apologize it's not showing here, but it's only a, a breath of heat on this thing, a couple hundred degrees for a few minutes, and you'll watch those grains grow. So it's not a very hard coating, and as you process it further, it gets softer and softer. It's not an especially great coating, but it does do the job of addressing the wear challenge of all these pins that are going to slide as you connect up your server bank. And it also has a very important corrosion function. So here are some of the pins inside there. This is the way they're made on a ticker tape. So here are some pins, and then they are plated uh, with nickel. So this whole thing is coated with nickel. And in service, they're going to corrode. In fact, in air, they corrode like crazy. And if you didn't put that nickel there, the copper, of course, would get green, and it would be very ugly. It would fall apart. But the nickel slows down the corrosion just enough to sort of make it viable. But you can see here, after an accelerated corrosion test, these things turn black and, and heavily corroded. And in fact, this is the lifetime limiter for this very unsexy component. Now, what do you do about it? Well, this kind of corrosion, this would happen in a few years in a server bank. You can't live with that. And so what do you do? You have the very clever industry standard that you butter it over with gold. All right? So you take a noble metal and you just say, look, there's a certain region on this pin where I'm going to have a contact and where I really need a noble contact. And so if you look closely, it's not corroded right here because it's buttered over with gold. So this is literally fixing a problem by you know, throwing money at it. right? So this industry uses gold as a palliative. And they use kind of a lot. So here's how much they use, four. Does anyone want to guess what the units of four are? Tons, yeah, but that's a good one. I've never heard that before. Usually someone will say microns. It's not microns, it's close. So here, here's what it looks like in microns. This thing is a couple microns thick. The gold is usually a, a micron or so. The four actually is billions of US dollars per year. So this industry literally buys gold bullion, they dissolve it, and then they replate it on these tips. Right? So this is a very expensive solution to a wear and corrosion problem. And so when I, when I learned about this about you know, 10 years ago, I said, wow, there has got to be an opportunity here to engineer the nickel just a little bit. And maybe we can put in a nickel's worth of metallurgy on the underlayer and, and save a few billion on the upper layer. And so I worked with Extalic. This happened right around the time when those truck bumpers were going out on the road. We started working on this problem. And here's the basic value proposition. So this is the uh, process of record. You plate nickel sulfamate on top of a copper alloy. And the grains are large. Here, what we're going to do is we're going to plate nickel tungsten. They call it extronic. All right? And it's going to be a little bit thinner because it's stronger and you don't need as much. But the real value comes in the stability, and therefore the stability of the performance. I already showed you. You heat this guy up a few minutes at 500. Not only do the grains go, grow, but you get interdiffusion with the substrate. Down here, you can't see the grains because they're 10 nanometers or something. If you heat it to the same temperature, not only do you not get the coarsening, but you also suppress the interdiffusion. So it's much more stable, much more processable. And so this is what we thought we would do. We would go into this industry and say, hey, you don't need to spend $4 billion anymore. Let's put a better barrier layer in there, and let's thin the gold. 
And for the sake of psychology, let's start by not eliminating the gold. Let's just like shrink the gold down by two thirds, right? So let's shrink it down that much. So here's what that looks like. I already showed you, um, this is the process of record. This is uh, nickel sulfamate, and you already know what it looks like when it corrodes. This is the accelerated corrosion test that predicts the lifetime of these guys. What you're looking at over here is the same product now coated with nanocrystalline nickel tungsten. And the beauty of this stuff is that that nickel tungsten is sufficiently better at wear and corrosion that it doesn't corrode. And so the gold is shiny here. It is here as well. But it's one third the amount over on the right hand side because the underlying nickel is superior. So who are my students? I saw the PhD. I want all the students. Show of hands for students. All right. So um, maybe you're wondering, you know, am I an entrepreneur? So I'm going to give you a personality test. All right. So I'm going to show you some real data. This is actually the, the first real field data when we started rolling out this technology. And I'm going to ask you a simple question. And you're going to just you know, mentally form an answer. And I'm going to tell you right now there are no wrong answers. So every answer is, a, is the right answer. And it's just going to tell you about yourself and help you uh, find the career that is right for you. So <clears throat> this is a set of engineering data. What I'm showing you here is um, a cumulative distribution of a key property for these connectors. Okay, So you make uh, thousands of these guys. And what you're doing here is you're measuring what you care about, which is the resistance. So it's an electrical resistance measurement. So you measure that. And what you're actually looking at here is the change in resistance after a number of cycles of mating it and unmating it and corroding it and putting it through a torture test that's an industry standard torture test. And so what you're looking at here is you know, there's three series of data you know, after a few days, 10 days, and 20 days. And what you're seeing is that the process of record makes a good product. The resistance is not changing. It's around 0. And all of them are not changing. It's very stable. And all the product is good quality. right? And that's the standard process of record. So again, what we were trying to do was roll out an alternative, a different nanostructured barrier layer with a, a, a thinner gold layer. And this is the first field data we got back. And I'm going to drop it on you. And I'm going to let you think about it while I drink some coffee. And what I want you to do is just what does your eye jump to and what is the most intriguing thing about the following data? Go. Are we ready? This is like reading Cosmopolitan and taking the personality test or something. <laughs> All right, are we ready? OK, so what did your eye get drawn to here? So there are a number of features on these plots that are very different. So it's like, you know, find the differences in uh, highlights for children. So if your eye leapt to these three data points here, these data points are above this red bar. And that red bar happens to be the specification limit, right? That is showing that there was a resistance change above a certain threshold. And in fact, that's the regulation threshold. So these three samples fail the test. These are failures. And so if you identify those three and you're like really worried that it's not supposed to change and these three changed a lot, that is true. And in fact, because of these three, you could never adopt this technology. This is a complete failure. And so if, if that's what you see, then there's a very important role for you. It's called a production engineer. And these people are like the defenders of technology. And they're, they're really good at making sure that stuff that gets out to the world is safe. right? So um, we, we work with a lot of people who focus on that. Now, maybe you saw this. And you didn't necessarily focus on these three. Maybe you saw, hey, wait a second. The first couple series are kind of stable. But then the final series has a shoulder in it. That's interesting. Like, so a lot of these are kind of looking good, but there's some unusual blip going on here in some fraction of the data. If you saw that and you thought, hmm, that kind of suggests there's a little problem here, and maybe I could dig in and solve it. If you kind of look at this and you want to dig in and solve, now you're a design engineer. right? Because there's a whole army of these people out there, too, that sort of troubleshoot and figure out you know, what is this blip, and is it addressable? So maybe. You didn't see the data. Maybe you just saw there's a lot of gold. And in that case, you're a venture capitalist. Okay. <laughs> so if you say, wait a minute, $4 billion? Did he say $4 billion? Is that really $3 billion worth of savings there? And if you ignore all the data, 
Good. Venture capitalist. <laughs> Maybe your eye was drawn down to this end of the curve. That's interesting. Like, these samples are below zero. What is going on there? So these things, after being tortured, are not only good enough, they're somehow a little better than when they went in. So if you saw that and you thought, wow, who cares about these bad ones? The, the good ones, look how good they are. Maybe we don't need the gold at all. That's my job. <laughs> That's the academic. So welcome to the ivory tower where all you're supposed to see is the optimistic best case, right? Um, so all of these people are needed, I think, to roll this out. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, uh, an entrepreneur is a special thing, and uh, so if you are the unique person who can simultaneously see all those things and keep them all in your head and love them all at the same time, this is what an entrepreneur really is. And it's not me. Uh, my partner, Alan Lund, uh, was my postdoc at MIT, and he launched Ecstatic with me. And he's the guy who can see the long-term exciting technical potential. He can see the, the cash value. He's also willing to, to jump in and solve a problem and make it meet the spec. If you can do all that, that's what an entrepreneur is. So we did fix this problem. I'm delighted to say it turned out to be a mundane cleaning problem. We didn't properly clean the substrate when it came in, and so we got random skips in the plating, and that was the problem. So when we did fix it, um, it has been a remarkable success. Uh, this is now in service. It has been for years. It is on literally more than 10 billion components today, and you probably use it every day and don't know it. And what kind of bond strength do you get in these systems? Obviously, it's good enough here. But in these and other systems, yeah, what do you get? Or has it been measured? It doesn't I, matter maybe so much in this one, but it is being mechanically stressed in some cases. It is. So in this industry, I don't think I could tell you that they do really good like interface fracture toughness tests and, and those kinds of things. I think that if the substrate is prepared well and if your, if your art is up to the state of the art, I think you get essentially good metallurgical bonding, but I, I don't think I have good data for you. Okay, so the platform technology. We went from bumpers and sprockets, and now we've gone into electronics, and we've done barrier layers. So that's sort of one aspect of proving out the platform capability of the technology. What I'd like to do next is talk a little bit about how you apply this to other materials. And that's been a theme of mine for the past 10 years or so, is that same thermodynamics. Can we do that again and again, right? So let's talk about that. So as long as we're talking about connectors, once you start circulating in the industry, you start to see other opportunities where you can apply your technology. And that's a good reason to, to go out and do it on your own. Here's an example. These connectors, once we started to see that we could reduce the gold, it's a really obvious question. Why are we using this gold at all? This was a decision made 50 years ago. It was the best thing to do back then. But maybe we can do better. The industry would love to have a non-gold or a gold replacement for that outer coating. But they've never been able to do it. And for example, wouldn't you love to go to silver? It's dramatically cheaper. It's less price volatile. It's just a much better supply situation. You'd love to go to silver if you could do it. But it's a metallurgical problem why you can't. And in fact, it turns out to be wear and stability related. So this is the stack I've been showing you, copper substrate, nickel barrier layer, gold on the top. And when you wear that, that wear surface, the gold actually, when you electroplate gold, it comes out really fine. The grain size here is submicron. So it's pretty hard. In fact, we call it hard gold. And when you wear it, it's sufficiently hard that you wear it and it sort of, you'll eventually wear through until you get to the nickel, but that's a hard and resistant wear surface. When you try to put silver on, when you electroplate silver, you get coarser structures and or you get highly unstable nanostructures that rapidly grow. And silver, when you start wearing it, you, it's not hard. Rather, it's soft and buttery and it galls. And so these things, not, they kind of stick to each other. So far from being a wear surface, it, it almost becomes like a welding surface. And this has been unaddressable. And so the industry has given up on this for a long time, and they've just used this. Well, gee, wear, <laughs> strength, stability, that's what we do. And so the next thing we did was, can we make a nanocrystal in silver? So let's do the same thing that we did yesterday and try to invent a new alloy that is silver-based. And let's add an alloying element that will make a stable nanocrystalline structure. 
Now this, I love this problem, and uh, I love sicking my students at MIT on this problem because this is a great open-ended problem, right? Go design a silver. You can use anything in the periodic table and go try to make me a productizable silver alloy that's nanocrystalline. So you can use anything, and of course, we now have to limit the search, right? So here's how we do it in my group at MIT. Um, this is, again, we're going to put on our engineer's hat, and we're going to start to think very practically. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to cross off anything in the periodic table that is not easily processable. So we are doing aqueous electrodeposition. There's a lot of stuff that you can't plate out of water, things like titanium and aluminum and so on. And so it's not, if they're not compatible, it's going to be hard. Let's just cross those off the list, you know, and you start checking these out. Secondly, in line with yesterday's lecture, we might as well go sustainable here. This is going to be a new technology. Let's make it something that has a stable supply chain. It's not a, a critical element. It's not you know, nasty, toxic, or radioactive or something. So let's cross off everything that starts with a U down here. right? Let's cross off all that stuff. We are aiming at an industri industrial application. So let's go ahead and cross off the expensive stuff. right? And that's, of course, context dependent. I'm working on a precious metal here, so uh, I just want things that are not going to make the value proposition completely negative. In the world of material science, when I tell people I'm intentionally segregating stuff to grain boundaries, a lot of times I see panic in people's eyes. Because in the industry, a lot of things that segregate to grain boundaries are bad for us, right? They cause embrittlement. Um, and so there are things, especially metalloids, things like phosphorus and uh, you know, silicon and things that are sort of on the cusp of, uh, of metal-like character, they're very embrittling. And so you want to avoid those. And so we actually use a bunch of DFT screening to identify which things should embrittle a grain boundary and which things shouldn't and cross off the ones that are going to compromise uh, ductility. And then, of course, we've got to do our thermo, right? So we've got to do uh, which elements from everything that's left, which ones are viable thermodynamically that can decorate grain boundaries. And if we can do all that at once and thread this needle, then that's what we should go in the lab and try to make. So you already know how I do the grain boundary stuff. Uh, yesterday, I talked about the regular solution model. I also talked about atomistic scale uh, simulations. Today, I've introduced you to Monte Carlo, lattice Monte Carlo simulations. We use all these tools to try to guess and identify which elements are worthy of our time in the lab to go experiment on. And I'll tell you the answer for silver turns out to be tungsten. <laughs> I apologize. This is, it's a total coincidence. I don't know why. I was, my life revolves around tungsten for some reason. Uh, tungsten is a very big atom, and so it, it, it does have a natural uh, size effect tendency to want to segregate to grain boundaries. So it does come up fairly frequently. It's also non-embrittling for most other transition metals. So tungsten turns out to be another you know, winner. So if we could but electroplate silver with tungsten in it, we might be in business. So the guys at Extalic, I'm now taking a team's worth of effort for years and pushing it under the rug. They worked on the chemical prospect of how do you plate silver with tungsten in it. They figured out a way to co-deposit those guys. And they came up with a product that they call Luna. And it is, in fact, a nanocrystalline silver. They played a micron or two of it on there. Here's the bright field and the dark field TEM that just show typical grain sizes in the Luna alloy are of order 30 to 50 nanometers. And if you go in and do the atom probe, you can, in fact, find that there is a ring of tungsten around every grain boundary. And every time one crosses a grain boundary, you can see a spike in the tungsten. You can see that the tungsten loading level here is pretty low. It's a half to 1% typically. And at the boundaries, it might be double that. The good news about Luna is that it is, in fact, a stable nanocrystalline alloy. So the cycles that you care about are things like this, 24 hours at 250C for like a solder reflow kind of operation. Conventional silver coarsens like crazy. Nanocrystalline Luna, utterly stable, right? So just like we saw yesterday, we've stabilized this thing. It is productizable. Because it is nanocrystalline and stable, it is hard. In fact, it is a very hard silver. And not only does it not gall, but it's, in fact, better than hard gold in the sense that it doesn't wear at all. It burnishes in, and it just slides forever, and we never actually get breakthrough to the underlying nickel under the same conditions that would cause it in the gold stack. 
So this is what material science is about, right? Legacy technology, not a designer material. Let's replace it with a designer material. We can do better on cost and possibly even performance. This product is plated in high volumes in production. And um, if you look around you at your electronics, you'll see gold everywhere, right? If you pull out your uh, phone and everywhere you look at things that are stuck together, you'll see gold everywhere. But you're going to start to see that converting to silver finishes. And you'll know that where that started. OK. So this is good. We can play this trick. Can we keep playing this trick? Can we do other things with it? I've always been kind of interested in going beyond coatings. And tomorrow, I'm really going to go beyond coatings because I really want to get to bulk materials. But let's take a first step today. What if we talk about the process that is related to electrodeposition that is called electroforming? This is basically electrodeposition where you peel it off the substrate and make it a freestanding material. So this is a way that a lot of metal foil is made. So you would plate it you would plate onto a mandrel and then peel it off and have a continuous foil. Or you can plate onto a mandrel, onto a shape, and then pop it off, and you can have a net shape production. This is a medium large industry for specialty shapes. It's an additive manufacturing proposition. So I would really like to use this kind of technology and make electroformed stable nanocrystalline materials. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and do something really different. Let's go, if we're going to make freestanding parts, let's work on something like aluminum. Let's make a really high strength aluminum, lightweight, high strength nanocrystalline material. Now, I just told you like five minutes ago, you can't electroplate aluminum out of water. That continues to be true five minutes later. But what I'll show you is that we can electroplate it. And in fact, we can alloy it with manganese to make the grain size nanocrystalline if we electroplate it from a non-aqueous solution, like an ionic liquid electrolyte. So you can buy some ionic liquid. And in no time, you can be plating aluminum foil and peeling it off the substrate. If you plate pure aluminum, you'll find that you get a very coarse grain size. It's polycrystalline. It's beautiful material. It's polycrystalline. Oh, and speaking of polycrystals, um, you met my dog. We called him Gibbs. I'd like you to meet my daughters. We named my daughters Polly and Crystal. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's the right reaction, because that's a terrible joke. <laughs> I floated those names with my wife, but you know, I got the dog. I didn't get the girls. Uh, so this is Kira and Meredith. These are the lights of, uh, lights of my life. Um, anyway, what was I talking about? Right, uh, aluminum. So if you plate polycrystalline aluminum, you end up with coarse grains. But just like in the other cases we've talked about, as you, add, as you add the second alloying element, you add the manganese to the system, you can reduce the grain size. This trend looks different than I've shown it before because I've logged this axis so that I can get up to the micron scale and down to the nanometer scale. Because as you add manganese, you can get down to 100 nanometers and even down to 10 nanometers. And you get really beautiful material. And if you go in and do the atom probe, the requisite atom probe, you will find, indeed, as per usual, we are decorating the grain boundaries with manganese and therefore producing these finer and finer grain sizes that are quite stable. We can make them in an incredible array of shapes and sizes. So at Extalic, they've made thick panels that can be up to millimeters in thickness, thick-walled seamless tubes up to a millimeter in thickness and a centimeter in diameter, uh, you know, hemispheres and nearly complete spheres that have been popped off their mandrel, microtruss structures, additive manufacturing, complex shapes, and a stable nanocrystalline aluminum alloy that has fairly interesting properties. And these data are uh, a little bit uh, less scientific than I would like, but this is um, sort of the value proposition here. If you make nanocrystalline aluminum, you have a very interesting lightweight material. And so if you do a strength to weight ratio and look at ductility, once you take metals and you normalize out their weight, it's sort of frustrating how tight a band they drop into, right? So you're looking here at steels and aluminum and magnesium. Titanium <coughs> is the yellow, right? So titanium is the premium metal that just ekes its way outside the band in terms of room temperature strength to weight ratio. Uh, so you know, to go from steel to titanium is like a 17x cost premium. So that's how much that's worth. 
the beauty of nanocrystalline metals is that they can be ductile if they're processed well. And these electroformed aluminum manganese alloys are remarkably ductile, even though their strengths are as high as a gigapascal. And so these are uh, data for nanocrystalline aluminum manganese. This is a long way from being deployed, but there's just a lot of promise here. Uh, added to the complex shapes that you can make with an additive electroforming process, I'm really hopeful that we'll see some applications in lightweighting. So we're getting close to the end of my story, but I want to do one more trick, OK? Um, I've now iterated over metals. I've iterated over applications. There's one thing that I talked about yesterday that I haven't iterated on yet, and that's the idea that grain size is no longer a single value. Grain size is now a uh, field variable, right? Remember that I showed you by changing the waveform as we're electroplating, we can grow different layers, right? So we can grow one grain size and then change the waveform, and we can grow different grain sizes, and it's all entirely at our command what grain size we want where as we're growing these things. And I feel like there's a lot of potential in that for the following reason. I showed you yesterday that these truck bumpers uh, from Ecstalic, I mentioned to you that we empirically optimized those things. We just made a bunch of stuff and saw what worked. And we ended up with an 11 layer stack. Is there magic in 11 layers? I don't think so. It's just kind of the best thing that we found by poking around almost in the dark. But think about this. Like, Try to look into the future, probably the distant future, but hopefully while I'm still alive. You know, We've talked about functional grading and composite layering in material science, we've talked about that for a long time. And there's a lot of applications where we know that has value. And now marry that with a coding process where you can arbitrarily layer and grade, and you can make any gradient you want. I find it a kind of a fascinating question of what do optimum gradients and layers look like for a particular application. And so add to that the idea that a 1,000 layers is somehow now viable as a technological proposition. This industry never would have thought about how to optimize a 1,000 layers previously, but now maybe we can. And so I'm very interested in the idea that we can use computers to accelerate an optimization paradigm to design multi-layer and gradient coatings. And so I want to briefly talk about that. So I promised that I'd talk about uh, galvanic corrosion today. And so here it is. So again, I'm switching materials a little bit. I want to talk about coatings that are sacrificial to the substrate on which you plate them. For example, zinc. If you put a scar into zinc, because it is sacrificial to uh, iron, you get preferential corrosion of that guy. And in fact, that is a beautifully well-behaved process that can be simulated with some fidelity. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a finite element simulation, and I'm going to solve the Nernst-Planck equation. I'm going to solve the concentration fields, and I'm going to solve the electrical fields. And I can actually sort of derive how this system, a coating with a scar in it and exposed steel, I can simulate and you know, imagine how that thing is going to dissolve. And so here's, here's a cheesy animation. That's a real simulation you're watching. You're watching that coating sacrificially recede away from that scar. So I like this because you know, it's a very important technology and I can simulate it. I can simulate it reasonably well. So if I do a corresponding experiment where I actually expose steel over a known quantity of zinc. The dashed lines here are that simulation I just showed. And I'm showing you profilometry data for actual measurements of a zinc coating. And I'm watching it recede. And I can get that model to match that experiment quite well. So this is a really nice application where now I can imagine turning the computer loose to design a new coating. So here's the thought experiment. Let's replace that monolithic zinc coating with a different one, an imaginary one. I'm going to allow that zinc, instead of having a single potential, I'm going to give it a possible range. So I'm going to imagine that I lightly alloy that somehow and shift around that, that taffel curve. Right? I'm going to allow some slop in that, and I'm going to be able to tune it. For example, what if I build a coating that has a gradient just over that range right there, and I run the simulation again? Well, watch what happens. This guy is going to be the same as you saw before, but watch this one up here. In the same amount of time and in the same solution, with the same average taffel plot, we have here 
a system where the outer layers are more sacrificial than the ones below them, and so they talk to each other, and the outer ones recede first, and then the, the ones below recede second. So we have a coating where all the layers are interacting and talking, and it's synergistic. And so this is what I'm interested in. I, what I want to do is I want to take a monolithic coating, and instead of just having a single field variable there, I want to know what should I build? What should the optimum look like? So let's turn the computers loose. We can use any optimization algorithm, but let's use you know, a classic one, like simulated annealing. So we will propose some shape, and then we will run that simulation that I just showed you, calcul calculate a lifetime, and then we'll start mutating that coding. Right? And we'll do just like we always do in Monte Carlo. We'll mutate, and every time we get a better coding, we're going to keep it, and, and so on. And we're going to mutate and find an optimum. So I'm going to do that. Um, in such a way that I will maximize the protection of a steel substrate. So let me show you what that looks like. I'm going to run this simulation. What I'm showing you here, this is the coating. Here's the substrate. Here's the surface. It's 20 microns thick. And this is the potential of uh, the distribution of the corrosion potential. So that's the, the peak here. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run this thing, and you're going to watch it evolve. It'll start at a high temperature. It'll be red, and it's going to cool down and turn blue as it locks into an optimum. And it's going to sample all possible structures with one caveat. For the moment, I'm forcing it to be monotonically graded. I'll come back to that if you care. But here's the simulation, so let's let it run. We're simulating a few thousand coatings. We are optimizing. We're ratcheting down, and we're finding what I consider to be a non-trivial final solution here, that if I want optimum protection with this available range of alloy design, what I want is a thin barrier layer that is most closely matched as possible to the steel. I want a thick overlayer that is very sacrificial. And then I want a linear gradient that's about twice as thick as this barrier layer. And that will give me an optimum performance. Now, the reason I'm excited about this is that all these layers are talking to each other. It's not merely a composite averaging proposition. If I took that entire range and I made monolithic coatings, I could walk around in lifetime between about 900 and 1,000 hours to failure. So any, monolith any, any monolithic coating in the family falls on this line. But when the layers start talking to each other and you have two body interactions, it's a nonlinear proposition. And this is what simulating annealing does. It goes away from that line. And in fact, a coating at constant thickness and the same sort of average value here, there's an easy factor of two in lifetime, an easy factor of two. This works not only in my head <laughs> and in the computer, but um, my, one of my recent PhD students, Sam Cross, did the heroic work of proving that it works in the lab. So here's what he did. He took our aluminum electroplating capability and he made three alloys, cleverly labeled 1, 2, and 3. AA aluminum alloy 1, 2, and 3. Okay? So these guys, as you can see, one is close to matched with steel, one is more sacrificial, and one is the most sacrificial. These are their compositions. We electroplate those guys on there. We use a more sophisticated model than the one I've been describing. We actually use an effective medium model that lets us simulate all kinds of uh, um, damage behavior in these coatings, including the onset of pitting and so on. So there's some science under the hood here. Sorry about that. But we can simulate accurately the monolithic coatings. And then we can run the optimization. So for a 10 micron thick coating, here's what it looks like. I'm going to optimize steel protection time during immersion in salt water. The baseline starting point is right here. This is what a monolithic coating will do. It'll get me 400 hours until failure. And when I run the computer and turn it loose and find optimum combinations of those alloys, we try a bunch of different things. And eventually, we find solutions that are dramatically better. The computer then tells us what to go in the lab and make. And it gives, it gives us different options, right? different lifetimes, different options that are more or less manufacturable. Sam went and made these. He made these in the lab on steel plates. He exposed them to real corrosion experiments lasting months. And I'll give you the upshot that here's the time until we get rust on the steel in the experiment. Here is what he's predicting with his model. The correlation is good-ish. But the more important thing is that the monolithic coatings are over here. And when you turn the computer loose and you predict multilayers and optimized multilayers, you move 
off of what you can do with monolithic coatings. So this is just the beginning of this technology, but I, I have high hopes for it. So now you can do the following. You take that toolkit to a place like Extalic, where they have all these tools and they can make all these different layers. What are you going to do with it? Well, you're going to try to address the most important societal challenges, such as when you drop your phone in the toilet. <laughs> you want to talk about a challenging corrosion problem. This is corrosion of electrical stuff you know, in fluid when there's power flowing through it. Now that is a challenging and you know, highly interactive problem. And a, a multi-material stack optimized could really do something good. And you know, the toilet is but one example. As electronics get closer and closer to the human body, this is a serious problem. How do we make metal components that can resist corrosion you know, when we spill our coffee on them or sweat on them or whatever? And I will show you that you know, there's a lot of promise here. And I hope you'll start to see products in this category coming out. Here are gold um, pins on a USB connector. And here is an optimized multi-component stack you know, using this approach uh, that Extalic has made. This conventional thing, which you might find in your phone today, fails very, very quickly. A couple of cycles of a test of corrosion and uh, wear under power, and these pins are getting eaten away. It's a matter of minutes when you drop that in the toilet to complete loss of the metal. And this thing over here that Extalic is rolling out has, you can see here, this is a two cycle failure. This is 45 cycles and not even the beginning of failure. So there is more than a factor of 10 enhancement in a corrosion property uh, sort of waiting to be had. All right, I'm having a lot of fun, but I know that you're not, so I'll stop now. <laughs> Um, I've talked too long. I do want to thank you know, the cast of thousands that really did all the work that went into this, uh, my students and postdocs at MIT, the team at Extalic that did all the work, and uh, the corrosion bit at the end there was a collaboration also involving corrosion experts at BP. And I'll conclude by saying that I love material science because new materials are platform technologies if you're willing to put on your design cap and be creative. A single material can be used in many places. And we have used stabilized nanocrystalline materials in all these places. A single processing method can be applied to many materials. And we've plugged our stabilized nanocrystalline materials into many different, uh, different base alloys. And of course, when you start combining things in new ways, there are a lot of opportunities that are far beyond our conventional bounds. And with that, I will stop, and thank you for listening. And I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> so, so I have a question about when is the right point in a student's career to shift from focusing on your studies to increasingly focusing on your business opportunities? In the experience you've had with the students who've come through, do you find it, that it's ever important to keep people from too quickly switching from being a scholar to being an entrepreneur? Or do you think that it naturally flows without control in a good way? I think, so I think my philosophical response to that is that those are completely separate and in, in many ways should be firewalled from one another. So um, the PhD is a very specific scholarly aim. Now, if you're working on a platform technology, the science can be relevant to a technological opportunity. But I, I would not recommend that a student, at the same time that they're trying to do a scholarly degree, be writing a business plan and, and trying to do something on the outside. You're setting up conflicts of interest there, especially if, it, as an advisor, you have some kind of an equity stake in the company. Now, you're on the danger of having your students working on things that can make you wealthy or something, right? So I think you firewall those things absolutely. I think if a student is interested in this, they are allowed to sort of watch and learn at a distance. But until the thesis is complete, you do not engage in those things. And you know that's, that's sort of a black and white answer. And it's always a little bit more gray than that. But that, to, to first order, that's, the, in my mind, the correct answer. I have a question about the use of the regular solution model that for the two component system, in your case, tungsten and nickel. Yep. As you well know better than I, when you plot all the thermodynamic properties of the solution of the two components, the entropy or the enthalpy or the free energy, they're all symmetrical. 
which means the two ends are there in the Lickow Ridge or the Tungsten Ridge. The environment is a bit roughly the same, the fact that it's symmetrical. And this doesn't like the real picture of a real solution. Is the use of the regular solution the proper way? No. The, model? the use of the regular solution is the first order approximation. And so I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow, but the regular solution is nice because you can write it down on paper, it solves analytically, and it's a very nice sort of screening tool. Um, you can make it asymmetric, uh, but, um, but it's not the right way to do it, and it's also not f even philosophically right. Segregation to a grain boundary, if you're assuming that in the grain boundary it is a regular solution, you've already made a mistake because the reason segregation happens is because it can order in the grain boundary. So there should be ordering and it should not be a regular random solution. So it is at best a first order model to get your head around what the right general trends are. The reason I like Monte Carlo modeling is that this is a non-regular solution and it allows for ordering and it captures all those non-regular effects in a way that is I think one level more rigorous and more suitable for actual alloy design. So, that's much better. Yeah, that that's probably the best. Right. Yeah. Different levels of sophistication. But you can see that what I do in my work, there's a mode where I'm trying to screen rapidly and figure out what to work on next, and then there's a mode where you dig in deeper and try to do it more with more sophistication. So all those tools, I, I need them all, because they have different purposes. But you you are correct. I don't know about, um, like much about the grain boundary structure, uh, but I don't follow when you uh, mentioned uh, it's, a, it's an ordering in the grain boundary. What do you mean by ordering in the grain boundary? I guess what I mean is that grain boundary segregation is an enthalpic effect. The reason that an atom would rather sit at the grain boundary is that it is in a happier enthalpic coordination state. So it goes there because it is, in, in, a, in a chemical sense, more ordered than it would be in the bulk, right? And it goes to the sites that are most accommodating first, right? So the regular solution model kind of assumes that things are randomly distributed. And if you're assuming that you're randomly populating a grain boundary, that's not what actually happens. The first solute goes to the most likely site. The second solute goes to the second most energetically favorable site. It's a highly enthalpically ordered kind of process. Comparing the grain boundary and the uh, grain cell in terms of chemical uh, energy. Indeed, yeah. It's always, in, in the Gibbsian framework, you're always comparing, comparing to the solution state in the bulk. Yeah. Please. Um, could you describe a little bit more the conversation between layers that you described? Um, specifically, what is signaling between the layers? Is it like a chemical potential or diffusion? The field lines are all the field lines are coupled, right? So um, you have so in the in the conventional the, field? Like a elect field? the electrical field. Oh. The potential field, yeah. So in the conventional galvanic sense, you've got zinc over steel, and those guys are talking to each other through the field, right, it's because they're coupled. And, and so the zinc corrodes sacrificially because it is in contact with the iron through the electrolyte, right? That's why it happens. Now you've got all these layers, 20 or 1,000. They're all talking to each other through the potential field, and so they can, like, have a coordinated activity that's, like, a little bit too... So personified, <laughs> but yeah. That, <coughs> uh, so I guess as a second question, would you not see that if your layers were not electrically conducted? Right. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. that's right. Yeah. Do we have time? Yeah. All right. Sure. So you talked about uh, the layering effect of your electric deposition as a way to uh, enhance the service life of your sacrificial anode or any coating for that matter. Is there a way to engineer it such that it's easier to strip away uh, the coating on certain surfaces as is done in uh, some impact processes? Hmm. Probably. I'll say yes. <laughs> as long as you have absolutely no follow-up questions. Yes. <laughs> Can you describe how Extalic gets into these different applications? Are you going out and solving a problem that you see exists, or are people coming to you with issues, or both? And yeah, how is this evolving? 
It's a little from column A and a little from column B. So when the company was founded, we were focused, so we went out and looked for the application, and we knew what we were looking for. It was Chrome substitution. So I was looking for hard coatings where I could see a real value proposition to a green substitution with a longer lifetime. And so in the beginning, it was us going out and finding, and, um, and in fact, that's how the electrical connectors came to my attention, is that I was talking to someone who had a problem with their connectors and I learned about it and so it starts that way but gradually as you build a company and you have a lot of people you know there's 60 people or some 50 people at Ecstalic and they're all connected to the community and so you get a lot of vectors pointing in all directions so you have a lot of opportunities to see problems in the industry and so it, it becomes more dynamic and and nowadays many times people come to us and say hey can that stuff you do work on this thing or that thing and so it becomes very synergetic if you can get it over a certain threshold. With that, I will close the session, and I hope to see everyone at the chair honorary session in which we are honoring two of our own faculty uh, later today. Um, there are signs on the doors leading north if you don't know about it and would like more information. And I would thank Chris Hsu for an excellent second talk. Thank you. Thank you for listening.